You're listening to the Author Stories Podcast. Bringing you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Margaret Wyatt. Terry Brooks. Sheena Kamal. Matthew Quick. J.T. Ellison. Walt D. Williams. Brad Ford. Corey Dr. O. Brandon Sanders. Robin Mom. Ernest Klein. Jim Butcher. Sherwin Harris. Visit HankGarner.com for archives of all the shows. Today's guest is... Well, thanks for joining me again for the Author Stories Podcast, where I bring you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Today, I'm super excited to uh, have Mark Graney on the show with me today. He's got a phenomenal new book. It's called Armored. I've had this book in my hand for a few weeks now, and it is amazing. If you are familiar with Mark's work, either with the Gray Man series or going back to his co-authoring work with the late, great Tom Clancy, and then following after uh, Tom's untimely passing, then you, not only do you do you know that you love that series of books and and everything that comes comes before, but Armored is a kind of takes us in a new direction. But it is one hundred percent Mark Graney. Uh, welcome to the show, Mark. Thanks for having me, Hart. Hank. I'm looking forward to it. Absolutely, uh, Mark. We begin each show with the same question, and that question is, what is your first memory? Of wanting to be a writer or storyteller? Hmm. I wrote uh, probably sixth grade, maybe seventh grade. Um, We had we had a creative writing assignment that the first one I can remember, uh, where our teacher wanted us to write a story as and have the rest of the class decide if it was true or you know if it was fiction or nonfiction. So she said just write whatever you want and then everyone will vote. And so I wrote this story about surviving a plane crash and everyone in the, I think, as far as I remember, everyone in the class thought it was real because the way I wrote it. And of course it was all made up. And, um, (laughs) and the teacher like had me after class going like, you were really, really good. Uh, you know, it was another 30 years or so before I became a published author. So (laughs) it's not like it really spurred anything at the time, but but that's my first memory of going like, wow, I did something and I did it well. Uh, I just kind of forgot to do it again for a while. I love it. Uh, Mark, I know that you live in Memphis now. Are you are you from Memphis? Yeah, I'm born and raised in Memphis. I lived in Miami for a couple of years and I uh, spent a good amount of time in Europe, I guess, a uh, half a year or so um, right after college. But yeah, I've, it's been Memphis ever before and ever since. I love it. Um, you know, I'm from just a little south of you in Mississippi. Yeah. And uh, I, I love, you know, hearing that uh, uh you know, home home guys, you know, make it big. How did a kid from Memphis uh, wind up co-authoring with Tom Clancy? You know, I was just a really, really big reader. That was I wasn't even really that great in English in school. Um, uh, I regret it. <laughs> it. It would have benefited me greatly. <laughs> so I, don't, right. I don't say like, hey, look, you don't have to be good at English to do this. I mean, it would really have benefited me to have paid attention. But um I just I just read novels and uh, not, I read a lot of nonfiction about military and history, and I started reading espionage novels. The first uh, thriller I ever bought in my life was uh, Tom Clancy's Patriot Games back in the 80s. I was about 19. And, um, and then after a while, I, I had an idea for a story, and I spent 15 years trying to write it, and I finally finished it. I, literally, I honestly began writing it in 1990 and finished it in 05. And immediately shelved it, wrote the next book in seven months, got that in front of an agent who didn't want it, but he said I was a good writer and I should try again. And that was, you know, very positive. And uh, so I wrote him a whole other book and he's like, "Mm, I think you can do even better. And so I wrote him a whole other book, which turned into The Gray Man. And um, so it was my fourth completed manuscript. And, you know, I I got published when I was 42 and I started writing my first book when I was 22. So how much time... uh, was involved in that first novel you said you started writing in 90 and finished in 05 yes but that is not me working hard for 15 of, years that, of that course, is me of course. yeah that is literally me shelving it and you know I, I just never really believed anything would happen but i like yeah. to do it and um you know it's it's like i look back and i was like if someone had told the 22 year old me that if he really busted his butt for four or five years he could become a published author i would have done right. it but I just didn't. I always thought that happened to special people, you know, and I'm just a normal guy. So, um, so you know, so 15 years on that first manuscript, but then yep. seven months for the second. Was it yeah. do you think that it was just the fact of, of finishing a manuscript 
and then going, oh, I I can get to the end. And now I, I know how a whole novel goes like like now I'm motivated to put the work kind of all at once into this. What what was the what was the difference? And, you know, other than the 15 years, what what motivated you to to do it again in such a shorter amount of time? Well, just as you said, I mean, like w- once I finished it and I had it beginning, middle and end and and edited, as you know, to the best of my knowledge, that, that book never got published, never even got in front of an agent. And right. I've, I've, I've since taken all the cool parts out of it and used it in other things. So it's, <laughs> it's, it's not <laughs> something that's ever going to go anywhere. But, um, you know, once I, I just kind of looked back and said, how hard did you actually work over the last 15 years to get this done? If you really like, you know, spent your free time doing this and then you could probably do it a lot faster. And the second book, I, I already had an idea and I wrote it in seven months. I'd written three novellas while I was writing the uh, the the big 15 year book um, and that kind of spurred me on because that was the first time I'd finished anything uh, when I wrote th- wrote these novellas so I knew that you know like I had the chops to produce something that looked kind of like a book <laughs> and it didn't mean it was going to get published or anything like that mm-hmm. so so then I just kind of threw my back into it so um, you your fourth manuscript became the Gray Man Is, did I understand that right that's correct yeah. What was, you know, because I, I think you've you published 10 of the Gray Man novels at this point. Is that right? Uh, 11. I'm finishing 12th right now. Yeah. Wow. Um, and and, you know, we've got news that uh, there's a, a movie coming to Netflix this summer with Ryan Gosling of, of mm-hmm. all people. That's fascinating. Yeah. Um, what was it about that character that one that uh, that got you the publishing deal and then has been a character with such. Um, you know, sustaining force that, you know, we're now, you know, you're about to start working on novel 12. What, what is it about that character? I think that he, uh, the character court gentry, Sierra six has kind of a, a good balance of strengths and vulnerabilities. He's not a superhero, but he has, you know, he's very talented at what he does. Uh, he's, he's an assassin, but he has a kind of an ethical code. Um, but he also has a lot of vulnerabilities. He, he, is a little bit more John McClane of Die Hard and a lot less yeah. Jason Bourne as, as far as <laughs> he's a guy that doesn't want to be there. He's he's doing the right thing, but he's kind of kicking and screaming as he's doing it um, because he you know he feels obligated for for whatever reason because of his sort of moral compass. But um, I think people re- I think that resonates with people, and I really tried to make the story look real, look plausible, even though there's definitely some over the top elements. Uh, and there are in the film as well, um, very over the top elements. But then I thought, well, it's my job as the writer to, to get people to believe that and not think this is just some ridiculous fantasy. So you, and I infuse the rest of the story with as much, um, detail and, 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 you know, real life as I can. And I think that balance just happened. You know, I just got lucky and that balance worked out. And I think that's what people like to see. When when you started working with Tom Clancy, you had already found success uh, on your own a, as a published author, and uh, you know had created characters and, and world that that was all your own. Um, what was it like then stepping into his world, and and what kind of things did you pick up from, you know, such an established author, um, you know that that maybe you have you know added to your author toolkit now. Yeah, th- there was really no other author that I could have co-written with um, credibly. Let's say um, I, I was a big fan of Vince Flynn, and and who died a couple years after that, yeah. unfortunately. And um, but I and I was also a, you know fan of Ludlum books and James Bond, you know Ian Fleming stuff. But I could not have written those. You know, I couldn't have jumped into that. Um, Clancy, on the other hand, I'd read every Clancy book. My dad who passed away before I even finished my first novel, he and I would like give each other the Clancy book for Christmas every year, you know, the big, whatever big monster Clancy book. And I knew the characters and and all that sort of stuff. So when I was asked by my editor, if I'd be interested in co-authoring with Tom, as intimidating as that was, I mean, you said I was, you said I was successful novels. I had been published, but I had two mass market paperbacks out at the time. Yeah. Um, so I was, you know, I, I had my hand on the lowest rung of publishing, but, you know, <laughs> I, I was happy well, to be there. There's um, a lot yeah. of people that would be happy to have their hand on the lowest sure, rung. Sure, sure. And I, 
yeah, I'm not minimizing it, but it was yeah. such a huge leap. I remember sure. when they asked if I would be interested in writing with Tom Clancy, I remember thinking to myself, why does it have to be Clancy? Why can't it be somebody just like a step above <laughs> me or two steps above me? Why do, why do I have to go up to the top from where I am now? It's so yeah. intimidating. But I really did know the characters, knew how they spoke, uh, knew the relationships between between them. So that was very comfortable. And you asked what what it taught me. I mean, my Gray Man books, I look at my first three Gray Man books, which were which were all written before I started working with Tom. And as one period of my writing career, and then books four and on as being different books. They're they're wider, they're deeper, they're more geopolitical. They have 100% of the action that the early ones do. They're just bigger, more fleshed out novels with with other elements. And and I credit Tom for that for sure. I remember um, when Tom was still alive, uh, and some friends uh, of mine and I would 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 talk about you know books uh, all the time and. Uh, I, I remember this one conversation I had with a friend and, uh, you know, he said, what are you reading now? And, and, and I think it was the bear and the dragon maybe mm-hmm. was, and, and, uh, as, and the kind of running joke was, yeah, I'm 200 pages in and he's still introducing characters. Um, yeah. his, his books were so massive and their yeah. characters were so huge. Um, how how do you manage a world that big? And, you know, and like you talked about, your books have subsequently become bigger. And mm-hmm. what what do you do to 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 manage all these characters? And you talk about how, you know, things are on a geopolitical stage that they're the worldwide. How, how, what what do you do to manage all this information and keep all of the, the storyline straight? Well, first, you mentioned Bear and the Dragon, and that book is over a thousand pages, and it's incredibly small print. <laughs> yeah. um, I mean, yes. I, I can't even guess how many words that is. I, uh, my longest book is 217,000 words. It was a book I co-authored with a Marine lieutenant colonel. The book was called Red Metal. It was 217,000 words, and I think it was 800 pages of larger print. So I guess Bear and the Dragon is 300,000 <laughs> words or 350 or something like that. It's amazing. It's um, so long that in the audio book, you hear the narrator go. <sighs> <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. You take, she's like, I'm going to take a week off and finish this. Um, but, but, you know, I write, I just write bigger. And um, I mechanically, I just throw everything into a Word document. And, and I don't even separate it by chapters at first. I just write story and I'll bounce around in the story and I'll start to flesh things out. And, you know, basically the way I write is I think, you know, it'd be interesting is if we were in another guy's point of view who was seeing this from this way. And then I just write the chapter like that. And that ends up creating new characters, new plot lines. Uh, a lot of times in the dialogue between characters, I'll, I, I like tension on every page and I will create tension between characters where I didn't really think it up. It's just as they're talking to each other. And then I say, well, how can I expand on that and make that tension like a thread through the story? And then it, that creates different subplots or whatever. Once you're done with the, with the first draft, then you look and go, okay, is this really necessary? Or is this thing that I kind of teased on page 250, it never <laughs> really pops up again, you know? So, right. uh, you know, books are really written during the editing and, um, and, and I always say this and I, I firmly believe it's true. When my book is 98% done, it's a piece of junk. <laughs> it really needs that last 2% to make sense. And I, I'd say if, if I die, you know, when one of my books is like, you know, a week from being turned in, I don't think anyone can publish it because it doesn't make <laughs> sense. Um, I'm not sure if that's true, but uh, I think my publisher might find a way, but it, I do, th- I do think that like, you know, it's the editing where you say, okay, this, all, this big world that you've made with all these connecting parts, is it too much? Is it too, you know, complicated? Um, you know, like what's the reader's experience going to be? Well, speaking of that, um, in, in 2019, you published a standalone book. And, um, you know, when, when you're dealing with a gray man book, um, I, I know you said that, you know, the editing is really where everything comes together. But you do have the benefit of established characters, established world. You know, the readers are going to expect things to work a certain way because of all of the things that you have set in motion previously mm-hmm. uh, with, with red metal that you published in 2019. And now uh, with armored um, that we're talking about today, you're talking, you know, um, 
the the 2019 book w- was a standalone, a true standalone red metal. I think mm-hmm. Armored is is the beginning of a new series. Maybe um, I'll let you clear yeah. that up in just a second. Um, but how does stepping away from that established world is is that uh, more difficult because you don't have the things to rely on that you've established previously, or having um, uh, characters in a world that are not established is that more freeing in a way? I'd say it's more freeing, and, it, and honestly, I think it helps your other series um, to to go away and to write something else. Mm-hmm. And I, 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 I'm always thinking about the book that I'm writing next while I'm writing one book. And a lot of time, I'm thinking about it, you know, very like wistfully, like, oh, I can't wait to get to that next book. That's gonna, you know, that's gonna be easy. This one's so hard. That's never <laughs> the case. But, but, you know, I've written two books a year, most years, I've written 22 novels in whatever, 14 years or something. So most years I've had two releases and, um, I I can't keep doing it forever because you know, the more books you have written, the more stuff you, more ground you can't cover again, you know, you don't write the same thing over and over. So, you know, there will be a slowing down process, not for a couple of years because I'm committed to, to some more books, but I, I think that, writing something new uh is a little bit more freeing um you know the the gray man books all stand alone you don't have to read them in any particular order if you do read them in order there is like a longer story arc that exists but every book is set up as its own story and you know it's self-contained um but when you write something you know that's that's a completely different world then i i I like it. it. It's freeing. And, you know, I want to keep doing that as well as continuing to do gray man. With, um, you know, when you've got a long running series, the gray man, for instance, or if you, even if you go back to Clancy and, and Jack Ryan, the longer that a character, uh, lives on in ongoing stories, um, they almost become superheroes or gods in a sense that, you know, mm-hmm. you, you, you throw everything at them and and we know that they're going to survive at the end of the book to to live another day and to go on another adventure and i would imagine that it gets harder and harder to um have these characters vulnerable and to to find things that that really terrify them and um you know to to keep the stakes high if you will um with your new book armored you it's so fun because joshua duffy is a character that that has a a physical flaw from the get go. I mean, we mm-hmm. we're and and I would imagine that uh, you know, was was writing a character like that. Did you come in, you know, um, figuring out like like how can I tie a hand behind my back and and then tell a story around this? You know, when we're so used to characters that are just larger than life and and are able to, you know. Uh, climb mountains and you know fight off you know a hundred terrorists and and all that then we meet this character and he's in a different place joshua duffy we begin in a different place that's that that had to be fun for as an author you know kind of to to give yourself that challenge yeah absolutely um i i don't think it's giving too much away because as you said it happens at the beginning of the book he he has a prosthetic limb and um that is something of a vulnerability, but it's also a strength. I know people with prosthetics and, and it, it, I think it sort of makes, makes you stronger in other ways, sure. uh, just, just sure. like any limitation that someone has, you know? And, but at the same time, I like, to me, the vulnerability of his prosthetic limb is the tension it creates with him having to hide it because to, to take this job that he takes down, that's uh, such a, you know, arduous job. Um, he needs to do it for, you know, to, to pay his family's bills. And he, but he knows it's a, you know, a, a very perilous mission and he kind of has to talk his way on there. He kind of has to hide the the prosthetic along the way. And that was almost the, that was almost the tension point in it more, you know, less of whether he's you know going to be able to do his job because I mean, there are literally, uh, U S special forces operatives operators, um, who have prosthetic limbs, uh, you know, lost a leg in a landmine and took them a couple of years, but they made it back to, uh, you know, back, back in active duty. And I have such respect for that. So, you know, anything can be done. And believe me, I, I have a friend with prosthetic limb that, that he can outrun me, which is a low bar, but I mean, you know, it's <laughs> like, so physically, 
there are, you know, there are pretty nice workarounds these days, but, um, but it was this tension of this thing that would, would have kept him out of this mission. And he has to, you know, live and work with these people and try and hide that at the same time. That was really the fun part, just what that would be like. It's funny that, um, the, the biggest hindrance for him might be his, his day job, um, at the beginning, he he's working as a mall cop, and that mm-hmm. might be more of a hindrance than his prosthetic limb is. You know, um, the way that no one takes him serious, and and he can't even take himself serious with this job that he's that he's doing. Um, mm-hmm. When when you begin with a character that that seems to be down on their luck and and can't catch a break, does does that empower you as an author? Like like let me see what I can do to turn this circumstance around and and how can I make a hero out of this person that that is just, you know, a, a lump of themselves? Yeah, that's a good question. And really, I think where that came from, if, I, if I'm not sure I ever thought about it, but I think where that came was, from was I was doing a lot of training with civilian military contractors and I got to know these guys and, uh, you know, like live in the in the bunkhouses or the team rooms or whatever with them. And I just, it's a very blue collar job. You know, it sounds like, I don't know, it could be romanticized. These guys are going down range and protecting dignitaries or whatever, but you know, these are blue collar jo- guys in a blue collar job. Yeah. And I, I have this guy who's doing it to, you know, raise a family and he's making good money at it. And then he's waylaid by a bad injury. And three years later, he's just scraping by and I think there's a psychological element of him doing one thing and being really good at it and now feeling like he, he's not whole anymore. And I wanted to open this story, not the beginning of the story, but, you know, like really open the, the main part of the plot. with Him uh, just, you know, having to fake it through the day, uh, you know, and, and just literally being in a state of depression of where he was. And that's why when he gets an opportunity to return into the into that world even though it looks like a terrible opportunity, it, 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 it's a well-paying job that comes with an incredible amount of risks more than he'd ever experienced before. He jumps at it out of necessity. And I think that's kind of why I built it that way. You are uh, kind of known Mark for the intense um, boots on the ground prep that you do for stories. Um, when do you ever get to a point where, you're like, this is too much information. This is like, I've gotten too, too far into the weeds here. Um, did, at what point do you know that, okay, I prepared myself enough to, to tell uh, about the job that this person does or this part of the world? And, and at what point do you kind of switch that off and say, okay, now I'm a fiction writer. I've, I've prepared my mind uh, to to put myself in the right frame of mind, now I just have to tell a story. Yeah, t- uh, Tom Clancy used to say, or or maybe it was Jean Le Carre. Somebody used to say, it doesn't have to be factual; it has to be credible. And I think that's mm-hmm. really really important. So I I just want to learn enough about something to be able to talk about it uh, intelligently. I don't always get all the details right, um, and honestly, that's become less and less important for me. I, early in my career, I would overwrite things because I didn't want to get the email from somebody saying, well, why would he use his MP5 when the such and such, you know, the, the muzzle velocity or whatever. And so I would kind of explain that in the first version of the story. And my editor would be like, yeah, we don't need all this. So, so I've, I've actually trained myself to, to not overthink it and not overdo it over time. But, you know, it's, I, I'm also constrained, constrained by the fact I have six months to write a book and I probably would do more location research and would do more, um, other types of research. If I had more time, I really do have to keep things moving. And, um, you know, right now I'm, I'm studying trains in Switzerland and I'm going to go to Switzerland in a couple of weeks and, and ride these trains. And, and, you know, I'm going to get the details as good as I need to, to really sell the story. And I'm not going to, you know, tell you how to build a train in the book. <laughs> um, your, your, uh, educational background is in international relations and political science. One one thing that we love about kind of these these giant geopolitical thrillers is not just the boots on the ground and the action scenes, but it's kind of the political chess that's being played on on another level. Um, how do you 
how do you start weaving together these seemingly disparate uh, story elements, kind of the 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 uh, the boardroom um, negotiations versus the 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 boots on the ground battlefield, uh, you know, operative uh, action scenes. Yeah, I mean, really, when I started working with Clancy, then I started, you know, expanding my world and thinking, OK, this is the decision that, the, uh, for example, the CIA is, has come to this decision. Um, where did that decision come from or how did that originate? Or could, is, are there points of tension or conflict that you can tell, um, you know, at the State Department or at in the White House or whatever? And you just sort of evaluate. I always think of like any idea I have in a book, it costs words, like words, you, ha- you have a certain number of words before your book is like too long and too messy or too complicated. Yeah. And um, so I always think like, okay, would that be interesting? Yeah, that would be interesting. Can I tell it in an economical bo- amount of words for the, you know, the size of it? And sometimes my books go longer, I mean, well, virtually always, my books go a little longer than I plan. Um, and then in the editing, I try and shave a little bit of that off. But I like I like to investigate, you know, I, I, I'm a news junkie and, and uh, interested in things like that. So I, I know a little bit about it, but I like to do the research. And then when I do the research, I'll find something that I just think is this really, really cool nugget. And I want to put that in the story because I, it's just like I just want to tell people about it. Just like if we were all sitting you know, by the fire or, or you know, having a cup of coffee, it's like I would want to tell people about something that I've learned. And uh, I, I weave it in the book if it if it. Uh, propels the story, I guess. Does does doing research and then, you know, uh, getting way deep into a, a subject matter and then telling a story about it, does it ever, um, uh, you know, erode your faith in humanity or in the political process? Uh, do, does that ever, like, just get really wearisome and, and tiresome? Yeah, I, I'm there now. <laughs> I'm there at that point <laughs> in my life, frankly. Um, I did a book a couple of years ago called One Minute Out, and it was about um, human trafficking. Mm. And, you know, obviously I knew that was a horrible thing. And I thought that would be something I'd like to learn something about and, and talk about it. Um, but it was just, you know, I was just it was a depressing book to write. And but there were so many things where it's like, OK, I've got to I, I want to talk about this. It's like I have a little bit of a platform here that, you know, the book hit number one on the Times list. And I'm glad that I, you know, I, I spoke about these things that were going on, not just in other countries, but in, in America as well. And um, so, you know, it was important, but at the end of the day, it does, it, it, it undermines your, you know, just your, your hope. It makes you more cynical the more you, you dig into things. And, you know, what's going on in Russia and Ukraine right now, um, you know, it's, it's something I'm writing about in my next book. And it's, uh, it's hard to write about. And it's, you know, depress- I would rather write a, a, something a lot more fanciful, <laughs> but these things are happening right now. And I, and I'm, I'm an author that's that's rooted in reality, so I kind of have to take reality as I find it. Right, right. Armored is book one of the new Joshua Duffy series. Um, what are your plans going forward, and and will will Joshua exist kind of alongside uh, the Gray Man universe? Kind of, a, you know, pop back and forth. Yeah, at least there, there's going to at least be one more armored book because I okay. know what that's going to be about. And uh, my my editor offered me a three book deal, and I said I've got one more idea that I know of. So let's just do two books. I don't want to get too far out there, you know, <laughs> over my yeah. head. I already have the Gray Man series, so I will be working on the second armored, and um, and, and I'm excited about that because I know I, I have a general plot, and um, and and then we'll see what happens after that. Excellent. Armored is available everywhere now. Grab it in Kindle edition or hardcover or audio book. We'll put links to it in the show notes. Uh, Mark, real quick, tell people where they can find you online if they want to dig into all the great stuff that you're doing. Yeah, my website is Mark Graney Books. It's G-R-E-A-N-E-Y Books, B-O-O-K-S, um, uh, dot com. And they can find everything about all of my books and about the Gray Man film uh, on there. Excellent. We'll put links to that to make it easy for folks to find you as well. Mark, so much fun chatting. Uh, Let's do it again sometime. All right. Thanks a lot, Hank. Enjoy. All right.